Welcome. All right, so we, we've heard this morning uh, from just an extraordinary lineup of world-class physicians about state-of-the-art care. What is Cordoma? How is it treated? Uh, the expert answer session today was, I'd say, one of the best we've had. Just, um, I think, a really good snapshot of how Cordoma is managed as a disease. And so now I want to uh, take a moment to look forward and talk about advances that are happening, what the Cordoma Foundation is doing to advance the search for better treatments and ultimately a cure. So this is my son, Sam. He, thanks. He's, um, he's 10 months as of yesterday. Uh, when I was diagnosed 13 years ago now, as of two weeks ago, uh, this was unimaginable. I never ever thought that I would get to have a family and ultimately have a child. And um, life has gotten just better and better and, and, and good and joyous in ways that I wouldn't have imagined. And I feel so grateful for having had these 13 years and having had hope during that time. Um, but there's this kind of weird tension. On the one hand, I feel hopeful and happy and uh, more and more optimistic. On the other hand, I feel as though the stakes are actually higher than ever um, now having this guy and um, my family. And so um, I feel a tremendous sense of urgency just, to, just as much as ever to make sure that there are better treatments on the horizon, to continue pushing the envelope of science and of, of medical care for this disease so that for all of us, um, if and when there is a need for better treatments, they are there. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today. What, what's coming down the pike? What do we have to look forward to? What gives us reason to hope? And I don't know if you all are like me, but there's questions that I have for many years asked myself and frankly continue to ask myself. Um, we heard some of them earlier during the Ask the Experts, what happens if my tumor comes back? And we've got a, we had a, a pretty good sense of that from the physicians we heard from. Um, radiation and surgery have improved dramatically over the last 10 years or more. And so now if, there's, if one has a recurrence, there's a pretty good chance that radiation and or surgery could be an option. But what happens if the tumor continues to progress? What happens if radiation and surgery are no longer an option? And we heard that the, the world of, of drug therapies, of systemic therapy, of, of the medical oncology options for Cordoma um, are still um, leave a lot to be desired. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, while there have been advances, and I'll talk about uh, some of them, um, there's still a lot of progress to make. But the question that I asked myself from the very beginning is, what's on the horizon? What's coming down the pike? Is there anything that might be an, become an option a year or two, five, 10 years from now? And um, when I was first diagnosed 13 years ago, my, my first instinct was to go to the literature and to try to wrap my head around what was going on to the best extent that I could. Um, and I mean, just to be totally honest, at that point, understanding the literature was, uh, was, was a tall order. Uh, and you know, I probably didn't understand three quarters of it. But I, what I did get a sense of was that there was very little happening. There didn't seem to be no, much known about the disease. There didn't seem to be really many people studying it. Um, there had been one clinical trial ever done. Just one clinical trial ever for this disease. Um, so at that point, it, it felt kind of bleak, um, but that kind of lit a fire under me. Um, and what uh, I'll talk about uh, over the course of uh, the, the next little while is kind of where we have come uh, in that time and where we're going, what we have to look forward to. But what I can say, and the, the, the main take home message that I, if there's one thing that I want everyone to leave with, it's to know that there are tremendous advances happening right now in Cordoma research. It's a night and day difference from what it was 10, 12 years ago. And uh, there are better treatments coming, and I think that there is legitimate reason for hope. This is not 
a, um, this is not wishful thinking. It's, there's, there are legitimate options that are coming down the pike that really provide, uh, I think, compelling reason to be hopeful. And this is, um, you know, I think this the sense of optimism, the sense of hope is something that um, really propels me and, and, and gives me strength and, and, and frankly, the confidence to kind of take the leap of ultimately getting married and, and you know, uh, bringing Sam into the world. So uh, just to kind of lay out the, the arc of the presentation here, I want to, for those who haven't heard it before, I want to just give a, a, a snapshot of what the Cordoma Foundation's approach to advancing research is. I want to give a, a quick snapshot of the progress that has been made over the last dozen years or so. And then I want to give a sense of what the future might look like and what some of the encouraging opportunities are right now. So, as I mentioned, um, the Cordoma Foundation was started 12 years ago. It was really nucleated by a group of families that came together and said, we need better treatment options. The, the, the status quo is not acceptable. We want to try to do something to create a better future. So at the outset, we were very much a kitchen table operation. As you can see here, this is literally the kitchen table of the dining room table of Heather Lee, our, one of our board members at the time. Um, and, and at that point, um, we, we, you know, we, we knew something needed to be done, um, but none of us really had the expertise or the wherewithal to, um, to know exactly what needed to be done. And so one of the very first things that we did was try to assemble all of the experts who were studying Cordoma, which at that point was not that many, um, as well as leaders in cancer research and leading physicians um, from other fields to try to, to kind of get the brightest minds in a room and come up with a plan to kind of understand what were the research priorities and what could be done to advance the science of this disease. And so we were very, very fortunate um, uh, through a, a series of events to be connected with the NIH and in particular Francis Collins who at that time was heading up um, the National Human Genome Research Institute, uh, formerly ran the Human Genome Project, very well known and, and re revered scientist. And um, he was kind enough to work with us to, to put on this first uh, international Cordoma research workshop back in, in Bethesda in 2007. And we had about 50 researchers from across the globe, the minority of whom had actually studied Cordoma in the past. This was really our attempt to try to get, get researchers interested and bring bright minds into the field. And you know, aside from being an opportunity to exchange ideas and to build relationships with one another, what we had tasked this group with, and the real goal was to try to come up with a plan for how to move forward. And what we walked away from this conference with was essentially the outline of a research roadmap. And some of you may have seen this in past presentations or on our website, but I, I always think that it's useful to kind of go back to it and just um, provide a, uh, a, you know, a kind of outline for what, what the roadmap looks like. How do you go from a, a poorly characterized disease that really no one has studied to ultimately better treatments and a cure? And so at a high level, basically what was mapped out was a kind of a five-step process. This is not necessarily unique to Cordoma, um, but definitely is um, uh, kind of um, uh, relevant to where we were at the time. Um, uh, essentially, for research to happen, uh, the very first step is researchers actually need basic scientific resources to be able to do their experiments. You need things like animal models, you need tumor tissue, you need things like cell lines. Without these things, there's not a lot that cancer researchers can do. Um, once, those th once those resources are in place, there's a, um, a constantly evolving suite of technologies and experimental approaches that could be applied to understanding the biology of the disease, understanding what makes the tumor tick. What are its vulnerabilities? What is unique about it? What might be able to be targeted by therapy? And then based on that insight, based on what, what those experiments tell us about the biology of the disease, that leads you down uh, several potential paths. That potentially um, leads you down the path of finding an existing drug that's either already on the market or in development that could be applied to Cordoma, or depending on where that, where that science leads you, it might lead to a new target for which there is not a drug on the market, in which case we would need to work on developing new drugs. 
if at all possible, to find an existing drug, that would definitely be preferable because drug development is costly and it's time consuming. And so a lot of the focus in the early years of the foundation was really to try to find repurposing opportunities, to try to find existing drugs that could work. I'll talk more about that. Um, and more recently, there have been opportunities that have arisen for new drug discovery, and I'll talk more about that as well. So once you've got your drug, whether it be a repurposing candidate or a new drug that you're developing, typically you have to test this in preclinical models of the disease. And basically that's cells and in particular animal models of the disease. And then once you've demonstrated some efficacy or some activity in these preclinical models, then you would move on to, um, to clinical research where you actually test the drug in clinical trials and in patients. So, where were we back in 2007 when all this started? We had one cell line, which is not enough. Um, it's very difficult to do experiments when you have a, basically an N of one. You have no idea whether what you're observing is actually a trend or something generalizable for the disease or whether it's just an artifact or some quirk of that one cell line. We had no mouse models and we had no sources of tissue. And so what this meant was that for the most part, scientists who might be interested in Cordoma, their hands were tied. There was really very little that could be done at this point. And so this was one of the key hurdles that had to be overcome to enable research in the field. Not surprisingly, given that, because these models and the, the tumor tissue, the sources of tumor tissue didn't exist, there was virtually nothing known about the biology of the disease. If you went to the literature in 2007, there were lots of case reports about uh, you know, patient had this outcome or that outcome, or maybe five patients were um, followed, or maybe even 50 patients. But, it, but there was very little. I mean, you could count on two hands the number of papers that really described any sort of meaningful understanding or, or discoveries about the biology of the disease. So very, very, um, very, very early days. There was basically no one developing new treatments. There were no drugs that were ever tested in animals, zero. And that's because there were no animal models, so um, not surprising. And as I, I mentioned earlier, there was one clinical trial that had ever been done. Um, so the way that I think of it in my mind, just to put a visual around it, is this was a desert. There was no life. There was very little happening. Um, and this was kind of daunting to realize. Um, you know, here we were, a small group of patients coming together. We're a small community. We don't have a ton of resources. How on earth are we going to change this? And we started doing a lot of research to understand how other organizations had gone about tackling um, various diseases. And I'm sure you all are aware of, you know, there's, for, for many, many diseases, there are organizations that raise money and try to advance research. And you probably are familiar with the traditional model. Basically, it goes something like you raise money, you solicit proposals, you try to select good proposals, um, and then you fund those, those proposals with research grants. And that's really important. Uh, there's a very important role to play. But what we realized was that this wasn't going to cut it for the situation that we were in for several reasons. So first, if you are soliciting proposals, it assumes that there are researchers who are actually interested or aware of your disease who are going to submit good concepts or good, good proposals to fund. Um, and the, the real issue with Cordoma was that there was virtually no one studying Cordoma. If you were to kind of do a survey of the top scientists in cancer research, probably virtually none of them would have heard of Cordoma. They certainly weren't interested in it. So what that meant was we couldn't just rely upon putting out a, a request for proposals and hoping to get good proposals in. We had to be proactive about recruiting top researchers into the field to take on the, the most important priorities that existed for Cordoma. Um, additionally, um, as we talked about earlier, a lot of the, the experiments that you would want to do were basically infeasible at the time because there were no tumor tissue, there's no tumor tissue or cell lines or animal models, et cetera, because there's no coordination or communication. The ecosystem, the infrastructure just wasn't there to really enable meaningful projects. And so, you know, putting, putting water in the desert doesn't all of a sudden make a vibrant ecosystem, doesn't you know, all of a sudden create, uh, you know, fertile farmland. There's a lot of cultivation that has to be done. So that's what we realized we had to do. We had to build this infrastructure. And then finally, a lot of organizations me measure their success by the, me the amount of money that they put into research, the, num the dollar amount of their grants. And, and clearly, the, the more money you can put into research, the better. However, um, we are a small community. 
We are not the breast cancer community. We don't have millions and millions and millions of people. And even if we are wildly successful, we'll raise tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars. That would be great. But we don't have you know, hundreds and hundreds or billions of dollars that are likely to flow into Cordoma research. And the reality is that cancer research is expensive. And so rather than measuring our success by the, by the total dollars that we put in, we realized that we had to be smart about how we invested that. We had to be, use our, our limited dollars in the most efficient way possible to leverage other sources of funding, to find ways in which our small dollars in could bring in larger outside sources of funding, whether that be from the NIH, from drug companies, et cetera, other foundations. And additionally, we also try to be very scrappy and, you know, whenever possible, get research done at no cost or fit Cordoma into someone's already funded project. Um, we, the way we view it, um, you know, if we can get the same work done by, uh, by making a connection between two different researchers or getting a company involved and not actually having to provide funding, that's actually a huge win because that frees up funding to fund the next thing. So, um, yeah, basically, if you were to kind of characterize these different models, uh, you know, one is reactive, one is proactive, one is project focused, one is ecosystem focused, one is focused on maximizing spending, the other is focused on uh, maximizing leverage. Um, and so that's basically the approach that we have taken over these last dozen years. So if you, were, if you kind of tie that all together, basically what this boils down to is kind of an end-to-end -end, um, research strategy that has two key pillars. So first, building the ecosystem. So creating all of the conditions to make it possible to do really meaningful research. And then secondly, very proactively identifying what the research priorities are recruiting the best researchers to take on those priorities and making sure that that research happens, not leaving it to chance, not being reactive. Um, and so with that being the, the kind of foundation, I want to talk with you now about some of the progress that's been made. So if this is where we were 12 years ago, uh, in my mind, this is what the field looks like now. It has really come alive. Um, there is tremendous amount of activity. Um, there are a tremendous number of new researchers entering the field. The pace of progress is really picking up. So the, the desert, as it, it, as it were, has, has come alive and has been populated with this just incredible community of doctors and researchers and scientists. So what is, from an actual practical standpoint, what, is that re, what does that ecosystem actually boil down to? What are the components of that ecosystem? Some of them are generalized across this entire research continuum. So it's things like having capable researchers in the field, it's facilitating data sharing among them, it's coordination among their work. And then for each domain of research, there are different specific things that are needed. Um, and so you can almost think of this as like different niches or different kind of sub ecosystems, you know, mountaintop versus valley, the, the kind of the life that's going to live there is going to require different things to be sustained. So basically the things in blue are the things that exist and the things in gray are the things that are, st are still a work in progress. But, but the point here is that a lot has been put in place that has enabled this really um, kind of explosion of, of activity. So uh, over these last dozen years, um, as a result of this ecosystem really coming together, there are, is now a vibrant research community that's formed. Over 350 researchers from across the globe, um, from the US, from Canada, from Europe, from Asia, um, about 300 out of these 350, and maybe there's more actually, have come to our research workshops. We've had six international research workshops now, um, a couple in the Bethesda area, and then um, more recently we've been doing them in the Boston area every other year. So a lot of activity now in the, in the research community. Importantly, because at the end of the day we want to get drugs in, into the clinic, there are now more than a dozen drug companies that are in some way working on Cordoma, whether that be at the preclinical level, so cells and animals, or whether that be in, at the clinical level in clinical trials. This is, this is huge for us um, and something that uh, I, I derive a lot of uh, optimism from. So I want to move now towards some of the specifics as opposed to kind of a general sense, okay, great, things have picked up, but what specifically has happened? So uh, we have gone in that span from having, as I mentioned, basically no cell lines or animal models or tumor tissue to now 
now having really an abundance of these resources and actually have now exceeded um, the initial goals that we had set uh, way back when in 2007. And I need to give recognition where recognition is due. Largely, this is due to our manager of research, Patty Cogswell, who over the last number of years probably has interacted with many of you because a lot of you in this room have actually donated Tumor to our biobank um, with Patty. So huge, huge effort on her part and really on, on the part of, yeah, truly. on the part of so many of you who have contributed and on the part of the surgeons who have made it possible uh, for this tissue to be collected and for these models to be created. Um, so we have now distributed these models to over 100 research labs across the world. And in combination with our research grants, to, to which we have, um, we've given out research grants to about 30 labs across the world, so the combination of these models, plus the research grants, plus um, a lot of uh, begging and convincing, we have been able to get a lot of research going, and this has led to quite a number of discoveries. Um, so all told, over 50 peer-reviewed publications have emerged. And what that's done is led to um, a number of really important discoveries. So about 20 so-called tractable drug targets, that means targets, aspects of chordoma biology that are druggable now. There are, there are drugs that are either already on the market or are coming down the pike that could go after those unique vulnerabilities in chordoma. Um, and then additionally, a very, very important new drug target for which there are not existing drugs. Um, and, and many of you have probably heard of this. It's, it's called brachyuri. For a long time, we've known that brachyuri is the diagnostic hallmark of chordoma. This was first reported in 2006 by Dr. Flanagan in London. And I, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time diving into what brachyuri is because it, it is so important for, for this disease and for, this, for all of us, really. So brachyuri is a protein. It's also a gene. So every protein that is, does work in your cells is encoded by a gene that basically is a, is a sequence of DNA. Um, Brachyuri was actually one of the very first genes that was discovered, and the reason being is that when it's altered, when it's, there's a mutation in Brachyuri, there's a very, very noticeable effect that that has on animals, and that effect is no tail. So first this was discovered in mice, but subsequently it's been discovered in other animals as well. You may be familiar with the Manx cat. Well, the Manx cat has no tail because it has a mutation in the Brachyuri gene. So, People often ask, is brachyuri the same as BRCA, the breast cancer gene? They sound similar, but they're actually different things. Brachyuri is derived from two Greek words, brachus and aura, short tail, because when you don't have brachyuri, you don't have a tail. So it plays a very important role in development during uh, when you're forming as, a, as, a, as an embryo um, for a lot of different parts of development, but then once you're born, brachyuri doesn't really have a role to play as far as we know. It gets switched off. Except that we now know that it gets turned back on in tumors. And when that happens, we know that it's probably because it's giving the tumor some sort of advantage. So the tumor finds a way to turn brachyuri on. And when it gets turned on, it allows the tumor to uh, acquire certain properties that, that enable it to propagate and survive. So this list has grown over time, and now it's actually up to quite a long list. There's uh, probably 10 different significant diseases on here, very common cancers actually, in which brachyuria is expressed and seems to play an important role. Um, I'm gonna focus on chordoma. So what do we know about brachyuria and chordoma? So we know a couple things. We know that, uh, this is a big discovery, that basically every single person with chordoma has an alteration in the brachyuri gene. But, but I don't want that to raise concerns before people start worrying about uh, the possibility of passing this on to your kids. Um, about 40% of the population has the same genetic predisposition. So basically what it means is that if you don't have it, you're not gonna get chordoma. If you do have it, you still only have about a two in a million chance of getting chordoma. Um, the way to think of it is this change, this alteration loads the gun, something else comes and pulls the trigger. We don't yet know exactly what that is. Um, additionally, in very, very rare cases, you can have a familial chordoma. There have been about 10 families in the entire world ever identified. 
they have an extra, a whole extra copy of the Brachiari gene as opposed to just a misspelling in that gene. Um, we also know in chordoma tumors themselves, brachiuria is turned on all the time. So every, almost every chordoma has brachiuria on to a high degree. Um, sometimes you can have extra copies of the brachiuria gene actually accumulate within the tumor. Even if you didn't, even if you weren't born with them, the tumor finds a way to duplicate brachiuria because it gives the tumor a, a survival advantage. Um, and then we know that the chordoma cells work extra hard to make sure the brachiuria gets stayed on, and that gives us a clue that it's really, really important. But really, the proof is in the pudding. Um, it's not just enough to know that brachiuria is there. What we want to know is, is brachiuria actually essential? And over the years, there's been an accumulation of data that has answered this question. And the punchline is basically yes. And not, so, so on the, the left of your screen, you see basically the top line is chordoma cells growing. So as that line increases, that means more cells. The, the bottom line is cells in which brachiuria have, has been shut off using a genetic tool called uh, shRNA, so RNA interference. Um, but the question is, um, is this, you know, th that's really encouraging and that, 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 that suggests that we should go after brachiuria. Um, but what, how does this relate to other tissue types, other tumor types? Is this unique to chordoma, et cetera? Well, more recently, technology has become available that enables you to not only shut off one gene, not only shut off brachiuria, but to actually shut off every single gene in the entire genome, and that's been done now. And what you can see is the, those two dots at the top of the screen, um, these red dots, that's, that's brachiuria. Basically what it's saying is of every single gene in the entire genome, brachiuria is the most selectively essential in chordoma. It's the most important gene in chordoma relative to uh, every other uh, tissue type. And what that means is that chordoma cells can't live without brachiuria, whereas other cells can. That's a really, really good thing from a therapeutic standpoint. It means if you could turn off or target brachiuria, you could potentially kill chordoma and spare normal tissue. So the great thing is brachiuria is not expressed in most normal tissues, except to a very, very small degree. But we, as far as we know, it's not really playing a role in these tissues. We can't say that for sure, but, but likely. Um, and, and what this leads to is two really promising therapeutic opportunities. So the first is to potentially suppress brachiuria to kind of mimic that genetic knockdown that I was describing. So could you turn brachiuria off? Or could you actually take advantage of the fact that brachiuria is, tends to always be on in chordoma and somehow target that fact, target the fact that it is uniquely expressed? And these two things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they're actually very complementary. Um, by using them together, you would probably be able to reduce the number of escape paths that a tumor might be able to find. So if a tumor finds a way to, for example, hide from the immune system, then you could target, you could suppress brachiuria, you could shut brachiuria off. On the other hand, if a tumor finds a way around your drug that's turning brachiuria off, well, there, it's, the brachiuria is on and visible to the immune system. So these, these two therapies, are really, or these two approaches really ought to be developed and pursued hand in hand. And so I'm really happy to share that um, last year we were able to partner with uh, another foundation called the Mark Foundation that is interested in solving tough problems in cancer and applying new and innovative technologies to, um, to uh, in particular, to go after undruggable targets, brachiuria being one of them. We partnered with the Mark Foundation to try to apply some of the most advanced, newest and cutting edge technologies to, um, to try to develop drugs against brachiuria, which historically has been considered a very difficult drug target. Um, brachiuria doesn't have the kind of features or, or structure that typically enable it to be, um, that, that, that most um, conventional drugs would bind to or would interact with. And so new techniques and new approaches are needed to overcome those challenges. So we've now funded uh, three different groups, five investigators, to work on taking on the challenge of, of discovering drugs that can target brachiuria. I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later, but I just want to, in the, in the meantime, talk about some of the um, advances that have happened uh, on the repurposing front. So we've um, funded a number of different projects to try to test drugs in, in the animal models that have been developed. Um, in the end, what we've realized is that it's the most efficient to try to centralize this in a single lab. We can do experiments basically for a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time by centralizing them, grouping them into batches, and, and doing it all in, in one facility. Um, 
And I'm happy to share that um, over the last several years, we've actually been able to test 35 drugs, over 35 drugs and combinations in these models through the drug screening program. And this is an example of uh, one of the drugs that um, has shown some significant activity. So the, the black line is untreated animals, the blue line is treated animals, very, very significant activity there. Um, this is a, a, a drug that was, that was mentioned during the Ask the Experts, a drug called cetuximab, uh, which is an antibody against EGFR. Um, and, um, and, and the great thing is now that uh, based on this, there's, um, there's actually efforts underway to try to get a clinical trial going with cetuximab. Ultimately, what's most important is getting drugs into clinical trials, into the clinic. And um, this has been very difficult for rare diseases like chordoma in the past. And as I mentioned, there'd only been one clinical trial ever. But over the last four or five years, we've put in place an infrastructure, a clinical trials program that is run by our uh, director of research, Joan Levy, who's over there uh, um, uh, and who joined us uh, two years ago from the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Joan has a tremendous absolutely a tremendous background in cancer research, both in academia and industry and in, in a very accomplished foundation, has been involved in developing a number of cancer drugs and, and running a number of clinical trials. So we are so grateful and so lucky to have Joan on the team. Um, and Joan is really enabling us to ramp up our research efforts significantly, in particular in the area of, of drug screening and clinical trials, but really across the board. So, yes. Here, here. So this is, this is what I derive hope from. Um, there are now five clinical trials specifically for Cordoma um, that this community together has helped to get started and to support. There is a pipeline of three more trials that our medical and scientific advisory boards have, have endorsed and that we are working to try to get started. Um, and the great thing is that Behind this, so th th these are just the concepts that are ready for, for prime time now. But behind this, there is a long list of additional concepts that are making their way through the drug screening program. You know, researchers across the world are making discoveries on a weekly and a monthly basis, and new, new ideas, new hypotheses are bubbling up. And as that happens, we're able to quickly test those hypotheses in, in the, um, the, the mouse models and move them into clinical trials much more quickly than was possible in the past. So that was a, a snapshot of progress to date. And maybe the most important is I want to look towards the future now. Um, and what I think is really, really important is that each of us uh, is in this room at a different stage in our Cordoma journey. Hopefully, all of us are going to remain stable and not have a recurrence. Um, but if and when new treatments are needed, or if and when better options are needed, um, I think all of us want to know that there are, there are options coming down the pike. And the good thing is that um, there are now options that are, uh, will become available on different time horizons. And so we, you know, we can't, as a foundation, focus just on the near term um, because that might uh, make us overlook more promising options that might be available in the longer term. But we can't just focus on the longer term because there are patients who need better treatments now. And so we've tried to build a pipeline that has potential at all time horizons. And so in the near term, in the next one to five years, um, the big opportunities come from repurposing. So again, taking drugs that are already in the clinic and applying them to Cordoma. And I talked about the mechanisms for doing that. Um, in the intermediate term, um, there are tremendous advances happening in immunotherapy that many of you have probably heard about on the news. Um, we need to apply those to Cordoma. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then in the slightly longer term, kind of best case scenario, five years from now, five to ten years from now, um, it, at the rate we're going, um, it's... Uh, uh, there, there's a strong potential to have drugs that can actually target brachiuri directly in the clinic. So from a, the repurposing standpoint, I, I showed the, the data from cetuximab. Um, we are working diligently, Joan in particular is working diligently to try to get this trial going. Um, additionally, we've been putting out an annual call for proposals, and we've just gotten six new clinical trial concepts submitted to us in the last month, and they're going to be reviewed by our medical and scientific advisory board at the end of this month. Um, and then 
as I said, there is this constant stream of new hypotheses that are, and concepts that are, that are coming through the drug screening pipeline. So we've got to keep that pipeline moving. We have to keep that going. Um, and, and that's why the, um, you know, this community rallying behind this effort is, is really so important. Um, in, the, in the intermediate term, um, as I alluded, there are tremendous advances happening in immunotherapy. So um, you may be familiar with the, uh, the Nobel Prize that was given in medicine this year to um, two scientists, Dr. Allison and Dr. Hanjo, for their contributions to understanding how tumors evade the immune system. And the, the knowledge that, that, um, that, that built upon that uh, actually led to the development of some very effective uh, dr drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors that uh, are being used for a variety of tumor types, including chordoma. But what's amazing is because of the tremendous successes that are being seen in immunotherapy, there's a, a huge amount of investment and a huge amount of work going into immunotherapy right now. There are over a thousand immunotherapy drugs right now that are being developed. I mean, just try to wrap your mind around that. A thousand different drugs being developed. Billions and billions and billions of dollars being put into this. And so this represents just an enormous opportunity for us. Um, that's money that's being invested not because of Cordoma. What we have to do is figure out which of these drugs could be applicable to Cordoma, because you can bet that some of them are going to be applicable. But in order to, to figure that out, we have to better understand how Cordoma interacts with the immune system. How does it, how does it hide from the immune system? Um, how does it react when the immune system tries to respond? Are there any aspects of the cell surface of Cordoma that might be visible to the immune system that we could target an immune therapy towards? So really important questions that need to be answered. Um, and so I'm actually, I'm really happy to announce that we are partnering with the most reputable and, and established and well-known funder of cancer immunology research. It's called Cancer Research Institute. They've been around for over 50 years. Um, they funded uh, Dr. Allison's work and as well as um, many of the luminaries in the immunotherapy field. Um, they are very well connected in the cancer immuno uh, immunotherapy space. And so we're, we're delighted to have the opportunity to partner with them to get the word out about Cordoma, about the opportunity to apply these advances to this disease. Um, and the thing that I'm, I'm really excited about is, as I mentioned earlier, we, we like to try to leverage, you know, use our dollars uh, wisely. Um, and so uh, we hope to support many grants with CRI, but they have co generously committed to actually match us for the first two grants that we support together. So these will be $200,000 grants, and they're going to be putting $100,000 into each of them. And the idea is that the Cordoma Foundation funds the other half. So huge, huge opportunity for us to get the word out about Cordoma, to bring leading researchers into the field to apply some of these very promising advances and technologies in immunotherapy to Cordoma. Now, I want to end on uh, brachyuri. This is something that uh, Joan and I think a great deal about, something that has really been energizing to, to me and to us lately. And the reason that I'm so energized by this is because, as I alluded, brachyuri was historically considered a very difficult drug target. And for a lot of years, we've known that brachyuri is important, but we've also been told by our scientific advisors to try to find a better target, because this is going to be so difficult to go after. Um, but as we have continued looking for different targets, basically all roads have led back to brachyuri, that, you know, all the evidence that I described. So we now know brachyuri is the Achilles heel of Cordoma. We have to go after it, but we knew it was going to be a, a tough road uh, to go down. And we knew that the likelihood of success, even with these new technologies that I described, would probably not be super high. Um, and so if you were a betting person, you might not have bet you know, you might not have put a lot of money that on, on the odds that this was going to succeed. But the amazing thing is that all three of the groups that we supported last year have initial hits. So what does that mean? A hit in this setting means a chemical compound that binds to brachyuri. So as I mentioned earlier, brachyuri, the structure of brachyuri is such that you would expect that to be very difficult and improbable, but they've done it. They have found compounds that bind to brachyuri. And that is the jumping off point for drug discovery. That gives us the ability to start doing chemistry, medicinal chemistry, to build drugs around these binders. Drugs that either will inhibit brachyuri or actually degrade it and make it go away altogether. Um, and so this is a, a tremendously 
significant milestone. I can't emphasize how enough just how, how important and how exciting this is. Um, what this enables us to do now is to kind of go down a well-worn path of drug discovery. The industry knows how to do this. The industry knows how to develop drugs once you've got a hit. So where are we? We're, we're basically here. Um, we are at the, 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 uh, the hit stage or the lead identification stage. There's still a lot of work to do, and this starts to get costly. Um, but the great news is that uh, the Mark Foundation is a, a tremendous partner in this, and we are um, right now uh, working with them to explore the next stage of our co-investment our co in, um, in, in the work of the, the grantees that we've supported. We continue to try to bring others into this field, but we're also trying to lay the ground for companies to enter this space, because ultimately that's, that's what's going to be required to take it forward to the clinic. Um, we've been having some really interesting and promising conversations with companies, with venture capitalists, um, with NIH labs that could bring resources to bear. And so I would just say, um, hold on to your hats, because there's a lot that's gonna be happening in this space in the next couple years, a lot of opportunity, um, and a lot of exciting things that are, that are percolating. So um, I, have always believed, but now believe more firmly than ever, that Cordoma is a solvable problem. Um, this was perhaps doubtful at the beginning when you know, you, we were essentially walking into a desert and there was nothing happening. But now this is a very fertile ecosystem. We know that we can do meaningful Cordoma research. We know we can solve tough problems in, in Cordoma science. Uh, we know that we can get clinical trials done. We know that we can do research across that entire therapeutic development continuum. It's not a matter of if anymore, it's a matter of when. Um, and so I don't want to raise hopes um, uh, artificially. I don't, I don't want to imply that this is going to be easy or necessarily fast, um, but it is possible. We can do it. And, um, and really how long that timeline takes is, is a function of how fast we can move as an organization, how much we can invest, um, and how many researchers and companies and physicians can we get to apply their resources and expertise um, to this problem. So um, I feel a tremendous sense of optimism, uh, more so than ever. Um, and uh, I think, look, it's never a good time to be uh, in, 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 a, in a position of having had a, a disease like Cordoma. But goodness, if there's ever a time to get Cordoma, I think this is it, because uh, there's, there's such promising things happening. So um, I'm probably over time. Uh, I'm, I apologize, but um, uh, thank you all so much for your attention. Um, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Shannon to, to lead us off into the next session. So thank you.